Hello? Yo, I'm there. I oh, told cool. everyone, I think they'll make it. I I chatted the link to him, I hope. Jeez. Yeah, here, 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 here he comes. Here he comes. Okay, good. Okay. Oh, man. What a mindfuck. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Computer conspiring against the author. You better believe it, man. I'm trying to make my life more difficult than it is. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you guys for hanging in there. I right. really appreciate it. So who we got here? Hi, Adric's here. Adric is from Kansas. Oh, Adric. Very oh, good, man. This is, the guy who, who, <laughs> this is the man who immortalized me. He put me in the libraries of Kansas City. Thank you so much. Wow. Sir. Thank you, Adric. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's a pleasure, believe me. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much. And cool. we got Rob. What's with the yeah. doll, man? Oh, come on. You remember Francois? I'm going to kick your ass. You don't remember <laughs> Francois. Uh, but the thing is, I don't have a camera right now. That's the issue. <laughs> and Henry, my favorite photographer. How are you, sir? <laughs> He's good. I haven't heard him speak, though. He has no mic, he said. No mic. Wow. <laughs> you could do sign language. Right. <laughs> All right. And now we got somebody else coming on. Oh, Jay. Jay D. Oh, man. So this is cool. Nice, nice little turnout here. I hear an echo. Yeah, I think it's on JD's. JD, when you, came, How are when you, you came on, we heard echo. Ah. 
If you have headphones, that'd be great. Um. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> All right. I think this is also broadcasting on YouTube, so... Uh, That's crazy. I didn't know uh, they could do it live. Yeah, I, I saw Hiko Simon do it the other night, so I said I asked him about it. They, uh, somebody gave me the information, but let you, Adric? Yeah, I passed on a little stuff about it. I think that's the yeah. only way to support more than 10 people on the Hangout is to have it recorded to YouTube. Apparently, right. it'll also let a bunch of additional people view in that case. Looks like it's still got a limit of 10 active folks, though. Yeah, well, I think 10 active is plenty. Yeah. <laughs> I think any, any, any more than that would be like, I don't know, might get out of hand. So, um, welcome, and thank you for joining me for my first uh, cyber reading of my book. Hi, my name is Loco, and I'm a racist. Yay! <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. And um, one second. And I'm sorry again about the delay. I mean, I thought it was going to be simple. I actually gave it a trial run earlier this this evening, and it worked out fine. So. Uh, I don't know what happened this time around, but I'll know better next time. Get started much earlier. <laughs> All right, so I don't know. Without any further delay, I I was I had some. I was trying to figure out which chapter to read for you guys, and I decided I asked I asked I put a message out. You know, if anyone had any requests, it's not too late. If you have requests, you can let I, me know now. Otherwise, I'm going to read from chapter three. I don't Which know the is. chapter number though, but when you were mathematic or master unique scientific <laughs> god Allah, I want to hear, I want to hear you show and prove. <laughs> Who is that? This is Rob. Well, Rob, okay, sir. You want to uh, <laughs> hear me show and prove? All right, any any seconds on that? Hey, that sounds good to me. Oh, okay. Let me. If you want to get warmed up with something else first, feel free. But that's that's my vote. All right. Okay. Let me get warmed up with something else first. How about chapter three? <laughs> yep. <laughs> chapter three, by the way, is um the eroticism of exoticism. And I'm just going to read an excerpt from that as soon as I can bring it up here. All right. All right, so this is an excerpt from Chapter 3, The Eroticism of Exoticism. Um, yeah, I was vulnerable to the call of the exotic, but it slowly began to dawn on me that libido and exoticism were not the only forces at play here. There was more going on than your usual lust trumps moral scenario. This realization was like waking up after a wild night of wanton and reckless gallivanting, going to take a piss and having it burn so much that you find religion in the urinal. In other words, uncommonly unpleasant. I used to hang out with this guy named Damon. He was, he was one of a handful of black guys I'd met in Japan willing to hang out with other black guys who wasn't as boring as watching rice grow. He was Canadian, but his street credibility was earned in Toronto's cousin down south, Detroit where he apparently spent quite a bit of time, for some reason that eludes me to this day. The Motor City was the arena where he acquired his American accent and street knowledge, according to him. I tried to tell him that, to me, Detroit only meant Motown, GM, Ron LaFleur, and the Bad Boy Piston that whipped Jordan Bird and Magic Johnson's asses, but he thought I was just playing, and I let him go on thinking that. Ron who, he asked? We were getting our drink on a bar in ABC. Tokyo, when I turned to him and asked apropos of nothing, why do you think we do this shit? I was drunk, but not that drunk, and so was he. 
He cut his eyes at me suspiciously and then nodded towards two Japanese girls who just walked, who just entered the bar. Then he winked at me like God had mysteriously answered my question on his behalf. I shook my head and took a swig of beer. This was going to be one of those nights I could feel it. But I'd been entertained desire of late to at least talk about it a little. Up until that night, finding some promising prospects and punks with the Japanese facsimile of a bump had been the unsung mission, and we were nothing if not focused. But my focus had diminished of late, and Damon had picked up on it. Are you turning gay on me, nigga? Look at this buffet up in here, and you gotta ask? For real though. He took a sip of the beer he'd been nursing and checked himself in the mirror behind the bar. I was surprised he didn't keep a mirror in his attache case, one of his accessories. He needed an attache case like a dog needs condo. He also had at his disposal all the latest high-tech gadgets Japan had to offer. iPod, top of the line cell phone, PSP, etc. In addition, he had conversation pieces, stuff he picked up for its kawaii the kind of crap Japanese girls tended to get a kick out of and served to neutralize some of that fear most of them had of anyone darker than a cafe au lait, which he barely was. Little doodads that gave the impression he had a soft, creamy center to his caramel exterior. He flaunted one of those creatures from Monster's Ink on his keychain. Nemo could be found dangling gleefully from his attache case handle, and Anpanman's stickers adorned his phone, which lay on the bar so he wouldn't miss a text from his girlfriend. He glanced at me, realizing I was watching him. They came here for us, nigga. Time to represent, he said, like that was the end of the discussion. You with this or what? He was already getting up off his stool. Damon had a very commanding way about him, but he usually reserved that aspect of his nature for those white boys in the office. With me, he usually eased back on his ego throttle due to the street cred he perceived me as having, my being a New Yorker and all. I glanced over at his prey for the moment, the two girls who just walked in. We were in a gaijin bar, frequented by foreigners and the Japanese girls who adored them, so there was no doubt why they'd come. It was just a matter of who got to them first and had even a minuscule amount of game. Unless it was some white boys, they didn't need any game at all. Damon was ready to make a move and was waiting on me. Two white boys were hovering, I noticed, giving the girls a chance to at least take their seats before they swooped in. Damon noticed him too. It wasn't about to let them do that. He told me tales of being cock blocked by corny ass crackers on several occasions. Nah, you go ahead, I said, deciding I wasn't up to the chase. All right, suit yourself, he said, undeterred, as he turned their way. But just as he took a step towards them, the two white guys moved in. Two real cornballs at that. One wore a retro Space Invaders t shirt, and the other a black leather vest over a white t shirt. Damon stopped in his tracks and wheeled on me. I could see in his eyes he was rummaging through his pent playbook for this scenario. How do you cock block two charisma cornballs and not come off as being so aggressive you scared the shit out of the J bitches? He struggled with this strategy for, a, for a hot 20 seconds or so and probably concluded that though the accomplishment would fit nicely on his pimp resume, to do so solo would require more effort than he'd gotten used to expending on J-Girl. He was spoiled. We all were. In Canada, he had never let it go at that from what he'd tell me every chance he got. Fuck it, there'll be more, he said. And he was right, of course. There was always more where that came from in Tokyo. The night was young and we'd hardly spent a thousand yen yet. So he sat so we so he sat back down. What the fuck is your problem? Nothing, I yelled. Just not up for the bullshit tonight. Then why the hell you come out? He snapped, irritated. You know what I'm about. That was true, and I started feeling bad about cramping his style. Sorry, bro, my bad. You feel guilty, don't you? Man, I told you about that shit. This ain't no Judeo Christian society here, so you need to leave those Judeo Christian values with the Jews and Christians. When in Rome, you know what I'm saying? These bitches just want to fuck, and so do we. It's a match made in Abyss. You can't be applying all that Western bullshit you got from your head to these bitches. Trust me. I talk to them. I know them. I understand them better than these Japanese motherfuckers do. Is that a fact? Yeah, God, he's saying, exacerbated. He hated to be doubted and felt his supremacy as far as knowledge and experience with Japanese girls was concerned to be irrefutable, a true connoisseur. Practically just got here, son. I've been up in this piece four years already. I consider myself an imbecile if I didn't know these bitches better than they know themselves. And trust me, 
son. You are what they're all about. You. Not these corny-ass white boys and definitely not these faggot-ass Japanese motherfuckers. You, nigga. By you, he meant himself. He was even looking at the mirror when he said it. Listen, I feel you, bud. Take these two characters, he said, cutting me off, pointing at the two white boys conspicuously and hoping they'd notice. He was still a little salty about their interception. Sure, they're sorry as white boys, and these bitches definitely go for that, but they'll debust it. Huh? Plus what? He looked around like Danger had walked in the door. I almost laughed. Sometimes Damon didn't understand my slang. Granted, it was New York slang and kind of old school at that. At hard as he tried to front like he wasn't, he was Canadian. I mean, check this out, I said, rephrasing. I feel you on all of that, but, well, I kind of met someone, and so what? I got a girl, too, he said, shaking his head. Man, haven't I taught you anything? Taught me? I spat, putting down my beard, screwing up my face. Yo, son, don't get beside yourself. You ain't said nothing I ain't heard a thousand times from a thousand wannabe pimps or a thousand corners. Niggas in New York come up the womb kicking the same shit you kicking. You ain't taught me shit. Oh, chill, loco, he pleaded. Why are you getting all uptight? I'm just fucking with you. Because you don't listen. All you do is run your fucking mouth. All right, fuck it, he said. So what was it you said? Something like, why do we do this shit, right? See, I'll be listening to you. So ask the fucking question. Because pussy is good, he drunk, like he was explaining one plus one equal two. And he smiled. Mo pussy is mo better. And I laughed, mostly because unaware he was quoting something I said a few months back but partially because it was almost impossible to get some real talk out of any of the black guys I met in Japan. I felt silly for even trying. Seriously, though, he said, suddenly with a straight face, tell me this Japanese pussy ain't the fucking bomb. I mean, I ain't no charisma, man. I don't know about you, but I used to get mad pussy back home, too, and not the skanks, either. <clears throat> Quality pussy from all kinds of bitches, white bitches, black bitches, Mexican bitches, even Chinese bitches. But there's something about these Japanese bitches that just make banging them more or something. Couldn't have a conversation with Damon without him finding a way to mention that he wasn't a charisma man and his uncertainty about your status, and that he always had more than his fair share of women. The charisma man was that guy who didn't get any love back home but became a super lover in Japan. His constant assertion of this to me spoke to his insecurity on the matter and made me wonder whether he was being on the level or not. But... Of course, I knew what he was talking about when he said the Japanese girl had a certain something. I used to call that something the J-factor. But at the moment, I was trying to deconstruct the J-factor, trying to understand it better. Maybe you hate them, I said, hoping to shock him. He actually thought about it for a second, shocking me. Maybe, he said, and shrugged like its relevance was inconsequential at best. How Snoop Dogg say it? I don't love them hoes. As he laughed, and he laughed. I mean, look at them, he ordered, scanning the bar. What's the love? As I looked around, I caught a reflection of myself in the mirror and got stuck there. I looked good. Like Damon, I was in a suit and tie as well. It was basically the neon uniform, and I hated every moment spent in it, but I looked sharp as hell. The suit was gray wool and a tie of pink and burgundy polo paisley. My hair was freshly cut, and my beard and mustache were neatly trimmed, and I was glowing like the oversexed bachelor I was. And that's when it hit me. I was one of those detestable charisma men. Damon disparaged at every opportunity, in the flesh. I mean, underneath that glow, I was pretty average looking, plus kind of thick in the middle with an oversized head. I smoked too many cigars and drank way too much coffee. I'd sooner underdress for an event than overdress. I detest fashion, actually. I do have a developed sense of humor, given to zaniness, zaniness at any given time, but character-wise, I have flaws galore. And the more debased of them, selfishness, laziness, and promiscuity, I hide beneath a veneer of boyish charm, artistic integrity, and an earthy sagacity. Before I came to Japan, unlike Damon, I'd had my moments, but nothing even remotely close to the degree of action I get here in Kawaii land. What if I told you I was a charisma man? I blurted out like it had been a truth, just dying to be unleashed in the world. Damon looked at me like I confessed I liked getting sodomized with lit candles. Nigga! Don't, man, don't be telling people that shit, he stammered, looking around like someone might have overheard. That kind of honesty, man, Macs just don't get down like that. I ain't a Mac. I know, but, he said before he could catch himself. Well, anyway, don't worry. Your secret is safe with me. What secret? 
that you were, uh, you know, one of them. And he nodded towards the two white boys, Space Invader and Vest Boy, who beat him to the punch. They were taking pictures with their cell phone cameras, posing with the two girls, one hand making peace signs, the other all over the place, testing to see how touchy-feely the girls would let them get. Apparently, the answer was quiet. Man, I sighed. If I had a secret, you really think I'd tell your ass? What is that supposed to mean? I didn't know it did, but that was the question that derailed our friendship. I mean, for a pimp, Damon was like myself, actually a pretty sensitive guy. And I do have a tendency to come at people who condescend to me with both barrels blazing, a defensive knee-jerk kind of reflex. Sometimes I'm even unaware of it, like this time. I hadn't even realized the severity of what I said. I thought it was common sense. If you want to keep a secret, you don't tell the cat with the biggest mouth in the office, even if he is your boy. Nothing, man. All right, Mr. Charisma, he said, snarling sarcastically. Let's see now. You done gone and find yourself a J-girl worth more than her Louis Vuitton bag. Am I right? So now, you want to, now you're going to preach at me about how we ought to be respecting these bitches, right? How I'm dead-ass wrong for taking advantage of these stupid assholes, right? How I'm a classic misogynist and how I need to check myself because misogyny does as much harm to me as it does to these hoes or some shit like that, right? He, my face must have registered mild surprise because he smiled like the devil. Damon loved that kind of re reaction. He lived for it. He set you up with all his Motor City street talking where profanity, bitch, hoe, and nigger find their way into every other sentence. And he slips in a word like misogyny. A word that is as far from his usual, I'm kicking it with my niggas vocabulary as Toronto is from Detroit and fancies himself impressive. I, on the other hand, and probably the greater evil of the two, feel a peculiar need to show I can be as potty mouth as the next guy by modifying my vocabulary according to my company, dumbing down or niggering it up, as it were, so I won't stand out. A survival instinct I've been honing ever since I was a pre-adolescent bookworm to avoid looking and sounding like I thought I was the smartest guy in the room or lack the capacity to keep it real. Ironically, this is an instinct that, was taking a, that has taken a welcome hit here in Japan because I rarely speak in plain English let alone speak to people who would question my authenticity because of a lack of profanity and colloquialism. Why don't we appear? See, thinker, he said, I ain't one of those stupid-ass motherfuckers out here running around Asia dick first without an inkling. That ain't me. He said like he knew I had doubts about him. I have four older sisters, and we're all college-educated, he said. They know how I get down, so they get at me all the time with the same bullshit you kicking, talking about how I don't respect women because I don't respect myself. And if I keep this up, I'm going to forget how I respect altogether, let alone love. And what am I going to do with myself then? And all that kind of bullshit. As if a nigga don't respect himself. Bet you that shit. A waitress came over and asked me did we want, and asked if we want another beer or something. Damon, still mid-rant, looked at her with eyes that could rape before he caught himself threw on his I'm harmless as a Pokemon smile and said, no thanks. I ordered a beer. When she walked away, he turned back on me and glared. These Japanese bitches ain't got no respect for us, no how. In fact, ain't none of these Japanese motherfuckers got any respect for anybody but Japanese. And the worst part is that they don't even fucking know it. You live here, nigga. Tell me I'm wrong. I got too much respect for myself to be respecting fools that don't respect me. My mom didn't raise me to kiss nobody's ass. You know what I'm saying? He actually waited for me to acknowledge the question. I was accustomed to ignoring, you know what I'm saying? My older brother used to use that phrase every other sentence, and he used to drive me nuts. I hear you, man, I said half-heartedly. I mean, I did want to talk, but I wasn't expecting a rant, especially one that made sense. Men can't be trusted at all. These bitches will fuck anybody anytime. Fucking don't mean a goddamn thing to them but an orgasm in the shower. They ain't laying around wondering if you respect them afterwards. Bitches, be, bitches back home be on that bullshit, but not, all, but not these bitches. They don't give a fuck about that, am I right? Ain't no morality standing in the way of a good fuck over here. They ain't going to church tomorrow or ever, and they know the big booty ain't got nothing against them letting some big dick nigga run up in that booty. And I take that shit. Tell me you don't, loco, and I'll call you a fucking liar to your face because you told me last, you told me that you did just a few weeks ago. I took a swig of beer and held my tongue. I didn't know what to say anyway. I know what you're thinking, and you're right. A few of them do have a clue how to treat people who ain't Japanese, but the masses, the masses have their heads and their asses. My girl's an exception, though. She cooler than a motherfucker and got mad respect for the black. At least now she does, thanks to me. 
But it took me about a year before I got through her thick Japanese school that all niggas ain't like me. After we jumped that hurdle, and that's a huge fucking hurdle here, as you know by now, that's when shit finally started getting real. Now she ain't fit to live here. She can't even stand her own people anymore. Now she can see these motherfuckers through my eyes. She ready to move back to Canada with me. He was starting to depress me. I almost regretted starting the conversation. Listen, Loco, I can see you I can see you going through some shit. And trust me, I've been there. All I'm saying is I ain't here and you ain't here to be the bigger fucking man and prove our moral superiority. And we ain't here to teach these racist motherfuckers how to be part of the human race either. We're just here to teach English, that's all. And they wouldn't have any other use for us otherwise. So we might as well take advantage of the few privileges our gaijin status grants us, and one of them is easy access to these bitches. I glanced up from my beer and noticed more than a few Japanese people were surreptitiously looking at us in that pseudo-sneaky way they have about them. His rant had drawn attention. I'm sure that was part of the reason he'd done it so loudly. He loved the attention. While most of the Japanese probably couldn't catch all that he was saying, the foreigners could definitely understand it. And though, unlike the Japanese, they pretended not to be tuned in. I knew they weren't missing a word of this. I didn't know whether to feel embarrassed or not. He was saying a lot of the things I've thought in nicer terms and felt about Japanese people, and the women in particular, and it would be hypocritical of me to try and deny it. That's what I'm saying, he said, like my silence was acquiescence, which it probably was. They just want a little exotic flavor in their lives is all, and I give it to them. Well, we're just big dicks to them. So what the fuck I gotta respect them? Why black women always be on some bullshit? Like I can't do both. Get all the ass I ever wanted and keep myself respect. You and that shit too, ain't you? What? I didn't say shit. Yeah, but you were thinking it, he said. He snapped. I know how you think. You ain't no mystery, loco. You think because you're from New York, you... Whoa, whoa, whoa. I hollered. Hold up. Don't put words in my mouth. Where I'm from ain't got nothing to do with nothing. So don't change the subject. All I said, maybe you hate them. So what if I hate them? This ain't no moral dilemma. A nigga like to bang hoes, especially these Japanese hoes. You got a problem with that? I did take issue with that, actually, but I wasn't exactly sure why. Listen, Damien, I'm just trying to figure out my own motivation, understand my own thinking. I don't give a fuck what you do. Yes, you do, he shouted, squatching me with his eyes. You know, Loco, I never told you this shit before, but you got a judgmental way about you. It puts me on the defensive way too often, and I don't dig that shit at all. Nigga, if you ain't with this shit, don't judge me. Don't hate the player. Hate the game, nigga. If you don't want to play the game no more because you found you some silk and all this polyester over here, cool. I'm happy for you. If you think you're going to lose your soul or lose your self-respect or whatever the dark thoughts you're wrestling with over there, fuck it. Stay at your crib and jerk off the J-Pone with that mosaic shit on it. Whatever gets you off, nigga. I feel you. I love me some J-Pone, but personally, I prefer the real motherfucking thing. And here... He waved his hand. He waved his arms at the room expansively. Here is where it's at. Real bitches looking for some real niggas. I looked around the bar again. More girls had arrived since we started talking. They'd arrived in pairs and trios, mini skirts and boots, hot pants and pumps, looking like they wanted to have fun, looking for something different, something exciting, something exotic. And this guy Jean Ball was the place to find it. They were looking for us. Damon followed my glance as I zoomed in on a quartet of foot-long, fluttering eyelashes around black lined eyes focused on the two of us. They were awfully cute. Cute as though I choked my chicken too many a night, both here and in the U.S., and a big part of why Japan is endurable, I confessed to myself disturbingly. You see what I'm saying? He said like the view had verified all he'd imparted, confirmed his frame of mind. Now, if you don't mind, this Mac here would like to get his dick wet while he's still in the prime of life. Fuck it, let's do this, I, just, I almost whispered like the words had escaped from some secret place deep within the chasm of me. Chasm of me. That's my charisma, nigga. Damon Roy pounded me on the back. Let's go represent. In the excerpt. <laughs> Hello? Hello. Very good. Hey. Huh? Very good. Yo, I put myself on mute. Hello, so I didn't bug you. Hello, can you hear you me? There, I hear you. We hear you. Hello. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. All right. So, um, are you, any questions or anything you want to talk about? 
Which bar was that? <laughs> what, 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 which part was what? Which bar was that? In Ebisu. Which the bar, bar in Ebis? Yeah. Is it... Um, is it um, What the Dickens? Or something yeah, like that? I, that's what I was guessing. What the Dickens. Okay. <laughs> the hub. Henry says it's the hub. Yeah. So did you figure out your answer to the question? Which question? Why are we doing this? Um, racism, misogyny, revenge. <laughs> huh. Yeah, I mean, I, I figured it out while I was with Aiko, and um, I was cheating on her. <laughs> but anyway, that's a different chapter. Yeah, I, I, I cried. I don't know if you saw my comment. I cried at that chapter, dude. She must have been yeah, amazing. She was definitely amazing, man. Man, fuck. I yeah, still miss her. I'm late chapter, I'll admit. Say, come again? Said that was an incredibly moving chapter. I'm agreeing with him. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Aiko was a incredible person. I still miss her. Actually, I'm going to visit her mother next week. Uh, she invited me over for dinner, and I don't know if you, well, you read the story. So there was her friend, the Chinese girl, Pepe. She's coming from Hong Kong. Yeah. So we all going to go out to dinner. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Pepe hasn't read the book yet, so I know it's going to be a trip. She said, oh, go buy it today. I said, oh, God. She's going to trip out when she reads <laughs> What did you write about me? How did you do that? You didn't say anything bad about her, so it'll be all right. Yeah. No, no. All she did was translate. Uh, but, um, that's pretty cool that you're still in touch with her family, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her mother, her mother and I, you know, we grew pretty tight after after that. Her father's still kind of distant, but the mother, right. she keeps in touch big time. That's cool. And if I if I can say it, and I hate to say it, but I think it's surprising, actually. What's surprising? To that you can stay in touch. I mean, unless you were really, really, and they were expecting you to get to marry her, then I can understand it. But I got from the book that you were they hadn't really met them much before she was getting sick. Um, yeah, I, I came to her house a few times before she got sick, but after she got sick, you know, we bumped, bumped heads in the hospital a lot. I see. So. I see. Well, I'm, I'm glad you had the connection still. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Mm. Let's see. So, Rob wanted to hear about the gods, huh? Yes, yes, yes. Hey, are you still in this in the Motosumiyoshi house? Can I say that name? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm Sorry. still over there. That's awesome. Because you said the five rooms. I'll count in my brain. One, two, three, four. Hey, that's cool. I know where you are. <laughs> well, still here until Spike Lee gets back to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm just up the street from you. I'm in Kawasaki with my my wife near Kawasaki Station. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, wow. So, yeah, yeah I'm, yeah, I, I'm going to use this as an excuse to come bug you sometime. <laughs> That'll work. Is that Hiko Simon? Is it, it's a sixth person. Who should have showed up? Yeah, Hiko Simon. Simon? Simon? Hiko. Hey, what's up, man? Can you hear me? Can't hear him. Simon? Okay. Uh, he, he's on he, mute too. He could hear us, but he wasn't. I couldn't hear him either. Oh, okay. 
Well, maybe he has technical issues. Okay, so you're ready for uh, Word is Bond? Yes, I'm ready. Likewise. All right, let me get a, get a swig. Henry gave the thumbs up. Okay, I'm going to go back on mute, so if it takes a while to come back, don't get scared. Okay. All right, fellas, here we go. Word is Bond. Uh, this chapter I dedicated to a friend of mine, White Boy Chris. The first time I heard my brother say, cool, say, I'm a god, I laughed my ass off. I was about 13, and he was in his mid-teens. To me, of course, God was black, but he was an old, bearded black guy who hung out in the clouds and did miraculous shit like taught CD Wonder how to play a piano and a harmonica at the same time without sight and gave the Fonz the power to snap his fingers and have chicks appear out of nowhere ready to get busy. God wouldn't need to drink Joe Weed or muscle-building protein shakes daily or pill for my mother's cigarettes. And for damn sure, God wouldn't spend his free time using his little brother for a punching bag because I'd drop dime on him. <clears throat> but say cool. I mean, Raleigh understanding God, Raleigh for short, was dead ass serious. The first major change was the name change. If I called him say cool, the penalty was swift and painful. He favored punches in the chest, but sometimes he'd get democratic and land a few in my gut. Though I was perhaps the only person subject to corporal punishment for not acknowledging the name change, by no means was I the only person he impressed it upon. The whole neighborhood began calling him Raleigh within a week of his becoming a god. His cronies would come to the house and be like, Peace, young god, where Raleigh at? And I'd be like, Rahu? And then my stomach or chest would twinge, and I'd remember, Oh, you need my brother, Raleigh. One sec. Another significant change, and this is perhaps more impressive than the blows he dealt me, is that he was always studying what he called the lessons. This from a kid who got in the boot from practically every school he'd ever attended, including Yuhurasasa, and to whom studying was something little geeks like me did. He, he carried these lessons around a thick green loose leaf binder with a large seven within a crescent moon surrounded by a star drawn on a cover in black magic marker. This he called his book of life, and he kept it with him at all times, at home and out in the street. I just had to know what could turn a total asshole like my brother into this almost ghetto monk-like existence he'd begun to lead since he began studying from it. I mean, he actually had students, groups of knuckleheads who would come to the house on a regular basis just to hear him wax righteously. This happened behind closed doors because my mother wasn't having none of this the black man is God bullshit up in her house if she had anything to say, anything to say in it. As many times as she'd been fucked over by black men, including my father. These guys damn near worshipped my brother like he was Allah. So I figured these had to be some heavy, they had to be some heavy shit in that book. Every day, I lay in wait for an opportunity. One night, he took his girlfriend Cheryl out to a movie, and I noticed he was empty-handed for a change. I crept in the room he and my, old, my other brother shared, picked up his precious book, and flipped through it. My 13-year-old mind was not impressed at first, though. It seemed to me to be a bunch of esoteric nonsense typewritten in horrible grammar, fading photocopies of stories so strangely worded they seemed almost to be in a different language. I got bored after about 10 minutes and put his book back where I'd gotten it. In the weeks to come, though, I couldn't help but see how his being a god had elevated his status in the community. People spoke of him reverentially, like if they were speaking of Martin Luther King or something. He directed an image, and people respected it. This god, Raleigh, carried himself differently. He walked tall with a humble swagger, like a gangster too cool to be ostentatious. He only ate certain dishes, no pork or anything even remotely approaching what he called swine. He even made Cheryl into the female counterpart of a god, which he called an earth. And she'd gone from wearing jean skirts, tube tops, and jellies to wearing long dresses, head garments, and sandals every day. 
She even changed her name to True Asia. These extreme transformations prompted me to revisit his book of life one night, figuring there must have been there must be some kind of hidden power in it that I had missed in my first sitting. This time I read it in earnest, cover to cover. I even read some of the stuff Raleigh had written himself. Plus degrees, he called them. Basically hardly legible dissertations on such illustrious topics as how to make an earth. That is, get some chicken heads and peel off her Daisy Duke shorts and adorn herself in refined clothes and refit in a queen and stuff like that. It was fascinating. This power to lift yourself and others up, to gain respect and notoriety, what we called juice back in them days, to get girls to do your bidding. I stored all of this away. Fast forward a year or two and Raleigh and I flipped roles. He returned to being Seku again with a new passion, graffiti, but I transformed into the God known as Master Unique Scientific God of Law. You might not have heard of the nation of gods and earths, but if, you, <clears throat> but if you've heard of Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, Wu-Tang Clan, Queen Latifah, and many other former and current players in the hip-hop game, then you've heard of some of its more famous members. In fact, Rakim was one of the reasons I was most proud to be a part of the 5%. So much so that I would spend my entire high school years as a member. I learned from the nation that the original man is the black man, the Asiatic black man, and that the black man is God. Furthermore, I was taught that the white man is the devil, drafted from the original man, and evil in every way imaginable, and that it was the duty of the original man to teach those who were ignorant knowledge of themselves. Yet again, the white man was evil. Only this time I was offered explanations for their evil nature that actually made me stop and think, predisposed as I was to do so. You see, this grafting process that created the devil was done by a great scientist with the intention of making an evil entity. And this scientist, being a god and all wise and civilized, naturally he was successful. For some reason, this made perfect sense to my adolescent mind. This was in the early 80s. At that time, the 5% were everywhere in New York. The police were not big fans of the gods. All they really need to know was that our doctrines were racist and identified the white man as devils, the New York City Police Department being white by a vast majority at the time, and the black man as God. That was sufficient to classify us as public enemies. The fact that among us were some actual public enemies didn't help matters either. I knew a few gods who were to be gangsters, some drug dealers, and petty criminals too. Hell, who didn't? Some of the gods I knew were only poor because they hadn't caught the right victim yet, and righteous only when it was convenient, when it didn't interfere with the acquisition of anything they felt to be a necessity at any given time, whether that be food on the table, a bankroll in the pocket, or even a new pair of sneakers on their feet, often taken from some unfortunate soul's feet as he walked by. And even though I was not an active criminal per se, I was one low-risk, ingenious idea from crossing that threshold. I mean, if a crime presented itself to me, and if the risk-reward factor was in a favorable ratio, and if I could actually envision its successful execution, hell, I wasn't above getting my hands filthy. My personal moral code didn't stand in my way. The poor righteous teacher code didn't even deter me any. The only thing that scared me straight was the thought of spending even a second in jail. I knew from first-hand accounts, my older brothers being regular tenants of the local jail, that the survival rate at least with your sanity or sphincter intact, but guys like me was low. I always envisioned myself, out of terror and suicidal reasoning, attacking and killing, if possible, the meanest bastard in there. If I was successful, I'd be relatively safe until I had to do it again, or I'd be dead. So jail, in my mind, was essentially a death sentence and the ultimate deterrent to becoming criminal-minded. One of my good qualities, though seldom used, was that I was honest with myself. When it came to bravado, I knew my limitations and usually remained well within them. I knew I wasn't much of a fighter, but I could wrestle. So I, if I got into a fight, which was rare, I, all, I would always turn it into a wrestling match. If I got my hands on my opponent, I always had a fighting chance. But I was what could best be classified as, in the nomenclature of that time, and now, pussy. I slipped under most radars because of my older brother's reputation. They didn't take any shit from anyone, and people just refused to accept that pussy could come out of that same gene pool and household. Plus, I hung out with guys with whom I could be myself usually, and they were so nerdy sometimes, they made me look and feel tough by contrast. 
But whenever I hung out with actual knuckleheads, I had to work to allay their suspicions. Some suspected that, my, that I would soften the cause, that my heart pumped Kool-Aid, and they were right. Especially when it came to shit like jeopardizing my freedom. You better believe I was pussy as pussy guy. But occasionally I do something unquestionably unpussy, usually without planning to do so, and postpone judgment against me. One of those unpussy acts was joining the 5%. Here was an act that necessitated the doing of things that most pussies, unless they were insane as well, as well, would never do. For example, as a 5%, you're required not only to, do, to study, but to show and prove. That is, justify yourself to just about anyone who approaches you. You had to prove to their satisfaction that indeed you were a member and engage in a sort of battle of words. Although the 5% tended to attract the more intelligent of youth in the hood, it also attracted more than its fair share of inglorious bastards. My co-members my co were some of the shadiest characters you're likely to see in the black community, people I would otherwise avoid at all costs. In preparation for these eventual confrontations we call ciphers, I studied the lessons thoroughly and practiced daily in the safety of my clique. My clique just happened to contain some rather aggressive geeks and wannabe thugs I'd known all my life. But I guess to someone on the outside looking in, some of them might have appeared to be as shady as, as, as shady as the gods I didn't know. But to me, they were just cats in my neighborhood. Around that time, I'd begun to understand something important. You can be as tough as you want to be. A tough image was as useful as actual toughness. But true toughness came from the heart, not from the mouth or hand, or even from your willingness to use a weapon. Your actual toughness is something less tangible than that. And once you realize you have it, you'll never be the same. I stumbled across this knowledge as I've stumbled across most things in my life, quite by accident. I was trooping through dangerous territory one harsh wintry day with my boy, Supreme Mathematics Universal Allah, I call them math for short, on a mission for weed, which was one of the two things that would raise my courage level. The other was girls, but at the time, drugs by far was a superior attraction of the two. So there we were in Brownsville, which, without a doubt, was no, man, <clears throat> was no man's land in them days. This was a neighborhood that produced Mike Tyson for Christ. Compared to the tree-lined serenity and relative beauty of the eastern park where I lived, Brownsville was a virtual wasteland. Empty lots, abandoned buildings, towering and or sprawling projects filled with just the kind of folk I dedicated my life to avoiding. At least that was the stigma with which I and many people who didn't live there branded Brownsville. But there I was, deep in the ebbing and flowing nucleus of it, ground zero at the time, looking for weed. Math was one of the shadier cats I hung out with, but he knew people, so I wasn't overly worried. I was just that, I was just that side of concern. I hit it, though, because Math, for some reason, that evaded expl explanation until that day, never thought of me as pussy. It was a hell of a compliment that he'd never paid verbally, but only by hanging out with me and daring to go places with me where shit could pop off at any moment, showing a confidence in me that I felt wholly undeserving of. But when he mentioned that there was a weed gate in the bill, that was, that was more than worth the trip. I said, let's do this without any hesitation. While on this mission, we came across a posse of gods on the street corner near Tilden. Tilden Projects had a reputation, as most projects did, an ugly one. As we passed by, naturally they noticed us. More specifically, they noticed Mass flag. A flag was a little button worn in a conspicuous location that indicated that the wearer was not only a god, but also had achieved a certain level of competency. Though I believed I was at that level of competency, I'd be damned if I was going to walk through Brownsville, any strange neighborhood for that matter, advertising it. I wouldn't even drive through Brownsville where I was. It was basically an open invitation to anyone to try you, and few things were more tempting to God, especially advanced ones, than to try another God. Sometimes this challenge was just a facade. The challenger would actually be interested in something else in your person, other than the flag, like your jewelry or coat, or even your sneakers could be coveted. If you couldn't show and prove to that God's satisfaction, he might find cause to accuse you of perpetrating a fraud, coming among God's cipher under false pretenses snake in the grass, of which it was his sworn duty to expose and destroy. His boys would proceed to give you an ass with it, a universal beatdown, or just icing, we called them. Sometimes it was actually legitimate. There were a lot of gods out there who were perpetrating for having joined the 5% solely for juice. 
Often gods like me were thought of that way. I looked like I needed juice. I had a friendly demeanor. I smiled a lot. I talked like a nerd. I was not a typical guy. Even though I had brothers who were genuine gangsters, I wasn't a hard case at all. At least Math looked apart, like his tar, gold teeth, a sinister glare he could brandish at the top of a hat, and usually played the part in mixed company. But when we were alone, he had another personality, vulnerable and sensitive, but with just enough of an edge to keep even me a little leery. He was perfect. I loved the guy. What he thought of me before this day, I suspect it was simply a guy he employed to keep his balance. Matt hung out with a lot of knuckleheads, and they usually peer pressured him into a lot of shit he'd have rather not gotten into. I never did. With me, though he didn't always, he knew he could let down his ghetto guard and relax, smoke some weed, listen to music, and just be light. And with him, I could get a feel of what is expected of a typical knucklehead of our age. The shit I'd fortunately been able to avoid by limiting my circle of friends to those whose sense of adventure rarely included a hard crime or violence for thrills. But on this day, things changed. Peace, God, one of the gods in the corner shouted at Math, as, Math and I as we passed. Math, not one for being out bellowed, re replied in kind, Peace, God! It was just a greeting, but the way he said it, it felt like a challenge, like he cracked his knuckles at us. Math had gold teeth and a sheepskin coat. They weren't about to take his teeth, so I wouldn't put it past these starving motherfuckers in Brownsville, but his sheepskin was fair game. Math's response was tantamount to, to shouting, eh, we ain't no suckers, y'all. I'd also return the greeting, but to be honest, I was well shaken by the subtext of this whole scene. There were about ten of them standing in a circle, seven of whom were wearing universal flags. One of them, a short, evil-looking bastard took an ominous step towards math and asked, what's your attribute, God? Mm. I come in the divine name of supreme mathematics of universal law, God, he replied, giving his full name as was customary, and then all got, and then all eyes shifted to me. I said, I come in the divine name of master unique scientific God of law, God, with all the authority of a rookie cop saying, stop in the name of the law or I'll shoot. Unique, he said, suspiciously looking at me with his head tilted sideways like some niggas tended to do to make themselves look crazier. It worked like a charm. What kind of attribute is that, God? The fuck? My kind, God, I retreated. I retorted, <clears throat> plainly restraining the offense I'd taken and acknowledging the red flag that had shot straight up my spine at his tone. One of a kind. His boys kind of smirked a bit. One even laughed. He caught it and realized that he'd been sassed and he didn't like it. Show and prove, God. Now, there were certain protocols that were tradition when gods met for the first time. First, there was a greeting, then an introduction, followed, if time allowed, by a discourse on what one has learned from the lesson. This process was known as building. The idea is that by sharing your knowledge, wisdom, and understanding with the cipher group, Everyone stood to benefit. It also gave other gods a chance to judge your seriousness, your ability, and your commitment to the nation. And if they were after something aside from a sharing of ideas, like a jury or money, for example, then they'd be, ex then they'd, then they'd be assessing the threat level you represented through how you presented yourself, reading you, as it were. At that time, I knew I had ability and had committed myself to improving and growing in aptitude as a god, but I wasn't zealously committed. I was basically a god when I was at school and in my neighborhood. In strange locales, I only greeted gods if I didn't feel a threat. And I always felt a threat, particularly in certain areas of Brooklyn. Brownsville being at the top of that list. I did most of my growing up in Crown Heights, and my corner, and my corner of the neighborhood was more notable for its West Indian population than for gods. In fact, most homegrown African-American teens, meaning minimum second-generation American, when faced with the choice of joining a clique or crew of some, short, of some sort, found those choices quite limited in Crown Heights. There were the 5%, of course. There was also the Zulu Nation, which had little to no juice, clout, in Crown Heights. There were some athletic endeavors, typically basketball or football, some graffiti crews or breakdancing troops, which requires you to steal spray paint or travel around battling other dance crews, also potentially hazardous, stick-up kids, boosters, shoplifters refining their art, and some West Indian cliques. 
It was some nerdy clicks too, of course, and many of the people I grew up with wound up in these in order to stay out of trouble. They kept within range of their front doors or traveled away from the neighborhood to other environments where they could be free to pursue their interest in insect research, flight, computer programming, etc. A good number of these nerds were first-generation Americans who, in the 80s, suddenly, with West Indian culture experiencing a surge in popularity, rediscovered the West Indian heritage and accents they tried so hard to bury previously, especially a lot of the Jamaican cats, and went Rasta. The Jamaican clique was so popular that even some cats that had no West Indian heritage to draw on became imposter Rasta, the faking Jamaicans that we call them. So, <clears throat> in general, Crown Heights was dominated by the West Indians, primarily the Jamaicans, Panamanians, and Haitians. In this way, Crown Heights provided a safe incubator for me to grow as a god. In fact, I was known as one of the stronger gods in the neighborhood as far as knowledge of lessons was concerned. But if Crown Heights represented an incubator, then Brownsville was some kind of Darwinian proving ground, the archipelago of Brooklyn. When that evil looking Brownsville god asked me to show and prove, I had immediately thought of true god. True God was one of the gods from my high school and was without question the most righteous God I'd ever met. For me, he was to the 5% what Malcolm X was to the black Muslim. That is to say, even if you didn't believe a single word of the religion that he touted, after listening to him, you acquired an immense respect for the man and his belief. I admired True God even though he scared the shit out of me. His favorite phrase was show and prove. If he became a lawyer, I wouldn't be surprised. And from watching him show and listening to him prove on a regular basis, I learned what these words truly meant. He didn't regurgitate quotes and obscure facts from the lessons like many gods I knew. Like no one else, he was able to truly coincide the mathematics and the lessons with everyday life in a way that would make that would leave no question in the listener's mind that the foundation of the five percent, that being the mathematics, was real and alive. So, though I never did so in school, while I was too busy smoking blunts and drinking more liquor and other ungodly acts, I emulated him this day in Brownsville. A master is one who knows and understands himself and his culture, but knowledge of oneself and one culture is, isn't sufficient. The devil knows himself, and he's aware of the wickedness inherent in his culture, so he's a master as well, is he not? The duty of the truly civilized man is to teach, to bring, to bring civilization to the uncivilized, to raise the mentally dead from their cryptic ignorance with knowledge, and if that man adds his own knowledge to the knowledge we provide, then he can refine his thinking with wisdom so that he can born his own understanding. His understanding will be similar to the God body, but not at all the same. His understanding will be unique, God, thus we are all unique, God, so we come together in this cipher and build or destroy each of us with a unique understanding, a unique style, a unique outlook. This would be a very precarious, possibly dangerous situation if it weren't for that knowledge of something that I presume we all share. Not unlike scientists experimenting with some volatile new chemical compound. Without the knowledge of chemical interactions of the basic principles of physics, God, well, that experiment could blow up in his face. But I studied the science, God, and the mathematics involved. And I know myself in my air life. And so I have every confidence that the result of this experiment will be the creation of a new compound. And if I didn't, then I also have the capacity to create an explosive that will achieve the desired result. Peace within my circumference, for I am a scientist. Thus, I come to the divine name of Master Unique Scientific God of Law, God. What's your attribute? I was mimicking true God's style of presentation. I watched him closely and listened to him carefully. If impersonation is the highest form of flattery, flattery then I was kissing true God's ass something awful. But the words were mine. I filled in the void between true style and my own with ideas I've been refining. I figured those brownfield gods were unaccustomed to my style of building. They looked surprised and impressed. There was a chorus of, that's peace, God. That was how gods expressed their satisfaction. I managed to suppress a grin, wearing it beneath a mean of nonchalance. The message I wanted to send was, this is how we get down every day in my neck of the hood. Math, math also built, and he too stepped up a little. He must have sent something amiss as well. Math was always a higher level than most gods in our, <clears throat> in our neighborhood, but by spending so much time with him, I was nearly at his level. I knew if it came to a fight, of course, I would fight, if taken to our hills was, together wasn't an option. But our best chance to not resign our ability to fight off ten motherfuckers. We were building in order to save our asses from catching a just ISIS or having our belongings confiscated, or both. By the time math was done breaking down today's mathematics, he was named appropriately, for the mathematics was his strongest suit. 
Half of these gods seem to be satisfied that we will write and exact the stamp of approval. Where you rest that god? Where do you live? Asked one of them, looking not quite convinced. In Medina, Brooklyn. Whereabouts? Another asked, one of the leeriest of the pack. This was a dangerous question to answer. So many neighborhoods had beef with so many other neighborhoods, and so many gods had beef with so many other gods. My usual answer to strange gods is bed -Stuy. A bed address would usually put you in a safety box. Nobody wanted beef with bed -Stuy. Well, usually that was the case. But if bed knuckleheads had recently come this way and done dirt, something that occurred often, for bed gods were known for making noise and cracking skulls and leaving corpses wherever they went, then it could have easily backfired. Maybe one of these guys was a relative of someone in, um, someone Bedside had left for dead. If we answered Crown Heights with his lack of reputation of being strong in the 5% community, then it could send the message that repercussions for robbing us would be light, if at all. If we said some housing project, chances are these guys are familiar with the project and might start dropping names. Do you know so-and-so? Oh, you, you roll with the guard so-and-so. And if we didn't know so-and-so, then there'd be trouble, especially with that word is bond thing floating around. Word is bond is short for my word is bond and bond is life and I will give my life for my word shall fail, which taken literally means if you lie, you should die. And when abused by some thieves or bullies posing as righteous can be misconstrued to mean if you lie, then you deserve to be punished. I wasn't worried about being murdered so much, but if we were to get caught in a lie about where we reside, that would beg the question, what else have we lied about? and there would certainly be consequences. Of course, this was my own ruminating because Mav didn't hesitate to say Ebbets Field, which was an infamous housing project cooperative in our neighborhood, but neither of us lived there. In the field? Where? You roll with the black? You roll with black supreme? Black's my cousin, Mav shouted, bold as hell, almost proudly. I know black supreme, and whenever he was with Mav, I found a reason to make sure I wasn't. I thought he was going to straight up rob me in front of math one time, and I had a distinct feel that math wasn't about to stand in the way, stand in the way either. Black Supreme was just that sick. So the odds of black having done something egregiously foul in Brownsville were higher than the likeliness of his being feared and respected. But maybe math knew something I didn't because the gods were all love, love after that. Clearly it wasn't fear but respect that black had garnered in Brownsville, or maybe it was fear, who knows. What's the difference? Either way, we were safe, and these guys just happened to be selling some of the best weed I'd ever puffed. And after smoking a couple of blunts with us, sold us the fattest dime bag I've seen in a while. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Hello? You can unmute. <laughs> <laughs> Unmuted. Hey. Very nicely done. Oh, thank, thank you, you. thank you. Um, you finished reading. Uh, so, any questions? The floor is open, and you might want to, you know, tweak this thing. Let your let your followers know what's happening over here. Maybe they want to tune in. Uh, yeah, any questions? How long were you a god? Uh, I joined 1980, and I got out like 84, 85. Wow. No, actually, my real question, I just realized, can I get a copy of that, the, the, the Bible, basically, that she was reading? It's online. It, just does, put in. Okay. Put in what? Put in uh five percent. Okay. <laughs> lessons. Lessons. It says one hundred and twenty lessons. Uh, put in. There you go. That's okay. it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Because someone else on the chat said this is the best chapter. Be yeah. Who was it? Oh, Adric, they couldn't have imagined this to exist, which same as me. <laughs> Why? I don't know, dude. It's just in my youth, nothing like this existed. Like, we're, we're more safe, I guess. 
and didn't need to to we had everything we needed I guess I don't know uh, well yeah, I, I like that one because it was just so different than my own experiences that I don't think in a million years I would have I could have imagined that scenario honestly. Uh, one thing. Yeah, I think that's part of the reason I I, I put it in the book. I, I, I actually um I know for, for for black readers it's not much. You know, it's like, oh yeah, I knew some god and all the all the black readers they always say that, Oh yeah, I knew some god. Oh my brother was a god, you know, like that. But every time I I, I I I'm speaking to white readers, they're like, what the uh, hell what? was going on back then? Yeah, but you know what was shocking? I went to this, um, you know, this bar in Shibuya called Coins. No. Uh, no. Anyway, this is this is bar in Shibuya, it's like a 300 yen bar called Coins. It's pretty cool actually. I went there and I'm with my girlfriend. And she introduces me to one of her. Um, one of her uh, uh, workmates, co colleagues, and he was a white guy from where the hell was he from? From Florida or Georgia or something, right? And you know, I, I have some, I had some copies of the book with me. I'm always hustling, and uh -huh. I told him about the book, and he's like, "Oh yeah, man." He said, "He said, uh, I said, yeah." I, he says about Japan. I said, "Yeah." He said, "I said also about some stuff in New York." He's like, "Really? You got anything about the five percent?" I'm like, "What?" He knew lessons. He wow. knew the the history of five percent. I was like, oh, wow. and he was young. He was like twenty five. Like, how the hell do you know this stuff, man? Oh man, I just do my homework. I'm, I'm, I spend a lot of time on the internet. I'm like, oh man, that was a shock to me. This is great. We sat there. We sat there, at coins, talking about it for like a good half an hour. I mean, he was well versed. <laughs> Uh, wow, that's that's cool. Yeah, that was cool. I just, I'm sorry, I'm typing. I just tweeted live conversations with Loco right now. I should have put your 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 um, Lokohama. Uh, any other questions? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Yeah, 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 no, it's uh, good, good to see, man. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, just listening to this again, actually, it reminds me, have you ever seen, there, there's a documentary that you can see on YouTube, it's called 1977, The Coolest Year in Hell. It's about New York in 1977. That's the blackout year, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I remember that year very well. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, know if it was the a, coolest year, but it was a cool year. <laughs> It's, it's funny, it talks a lot about, uh, not, about not about the 5%, but it talks about the stuff that, around that, like the rap move, the hip-hop movement. And a lot of people attribute the hip-hop movement to the looting that took place during the blackout <laughs> because a lot of other people got their equipment from that. But um, it kind of goes through lots of kind of aspects of that, sort of the music culture and the, the pop culture of that year. I didn't know anything about hip-hop in 77. Well, that's, I mean, that, that was like... Um, Buddy, uh, Planet Rock, uh, the old the old guys. Jeez, oh god, I'm getting so no, old. Said, yeah. IMDb says Ed Cog. Uh, wait, wait. KRS One, Grandmaster Kaz. Exactly. That, DJ that. Disco Wiz. But, Legs oh. McNeil. Hey, there's your brother, Legs McNeil. <laughs> Who's <laughs> Legs? You... Seven. Wow. Africa Bombata, Africa Bombata, 1977. They were out in parks in Brooklyn, inventing, yeah. you know, like modern. Africa Bombata is actually Zulu Nation. Well, they Zulu Nation. Zulu Nation. Yeah, they're the ones who started Zulu Nation. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't, well, there you go. I didn't. <laughs> but that's the whole thing. Like that, that music and that culture was really like where I lived in, in New Zealand in the army camps, which were the the Maori people in New Zealand kind of co-opted a lot of the black hip-hop culture from that time. So I was surrounded by that, the way it had been imported, like through, you know, through pop culture. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was, for all the music and everything, I was like really deeply kind of surrounded by growing up, but I never understood like the way that you explained it, where all that was from. That, that's what I loved about that. Uh, 
thank you. So yeah, no, no, no. It's, uh, I'm gonna check out. The, I'm gonna check out the documentary. It's called 1977. Uh, yeah, the, the coolest year in hell. Chatted it. Click on the link that Hiko just chatted. In fact, I can find it. I'm sure I saw it on YouTube. I, I I put an IMDb link, but wait a minute. I'm sure I can find this. Okay. I'll find it the YouTube link for it. It's it's a yeah, it's a great documentary. Is it mostly about the art, or is there violence in it? Uh, no, it's, it's mostly about music, or, okay. or sort of the it's okay. about the punk movement, the hip hop movement. Um, also the gay scene and kind of, you know, like just, just the kind of the, the pop culture in New York in that particular year. Here we go. So here's the multi-part, part one. Oh, sweet. Thank you. Go, go from this, this link. It's, a, it's another thing. It's a bit like your chapter of that book. It just kind of, I, I saw it like late last year and it was another thing, which all these things that I kind of love and book I knew it's kind of showed me a different aspect. How, how is the book going, by the way? <laughs> um, um, it's going okay. Yeah. It's doing okay. I mean, I've done a, a couple of promotions recently to try to build up the readership, try to spread the word for more. Um, but uh, I'm still, you know, I'm still hustling, <laughs> still grinding, and trying to work on the second book too. At the same yeah. time. Yeah. What's that noise? It sounds like. Hey, who's that there? Somebody knew. Hello? Here you go. You go. Hi there. Probably mute. You might. Okay. I'm new, yeah. I'm friends of uh, Hiko Sayamon on Facebook. Oh. And I was curious, just checking out. Yeah. Well, this this guy, um, Baye, uh, Oklahoma, he, he wrote a fantastic book, which uh, I did a review on like way back, well, a few months ago now. I did awesome. a third reading of one of the chapters, but it's a very, very, very good book. Well, welcome, Hugo. Thank you for checking in. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. <laughs> the book was very introspective to me or for me, I, and I want to actually uh, take a chance to apologize to Loco here, because this is a kind of, this book was kind of anecdotal, and this story I'm about to say is anecdotal, that the day that we met, when we, he moved into the same Gaijin house where I was living in Tokyo, uh, I said something that was really fucking stupid at the time, but just just dumb. Because <laughs> I was like, hey, how's it going? And he's like, yeah, I like to drink and watch basketball. And I'm like, oh, man, I hate basketball, and I don't drink. He's like, well, do you smoke? I'm like, nope, I don't smoke. And I said something that I'm really embarrassed about. I said, like, are you white? Like that, I think. And I realized... Fuck, I could have said, are you American? Yes. I could have said any number of other things. Are you male? Are you, you know, enjoying Tokyo? So many things that we do have in common. And for a long time, I thought, if I could go back in time and correct my stupid joke, which was like a bad joke, it came out wrong, and I'm really sad about that. But... Really? The book. Do you remember that? Do you remember? No. <laughs> I do remember. Cause I was like, as a joke, are you white? You're know, looking for something in common. Obviously, that's not in common. But I was like, stupid. I could have said a bunch of other things. So that uh, the book really brought to, because you talk about the, some of the Japanese students who were like, oh, yeah, but this is different, and that's different, and this is different. And I don't want to be like that, but right. at that moment I was, and I'm like, fuck. So thanks for writing the book to, to remind me that, yes, and remind people, we're a lot more the same than we are different. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you for getting it. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. Thank you for writing it. You're welcome. 
But yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I truly believe that. And for some reason, the culture is teaching us to be divisive, as best I can tell. There are movements like Zeitgeist that's like, look, we're really the same. It's the whole monetary system that's trying to pull us apart and different things like that. And so, Loco, doing your part as well to say, look, we're all the same. We're all racist, but we're all the same. Let's stop being so silly. So thank you. Yeah, in your book, uh, well, uh, this is one of the chapters I think I mentioned. It's, this kind of hit me because, again, like other people are saying, as a, as a white person from New Zealand, you know, it's just kind of alien to me, and you brought it so vividly. You know, I, I, I love that. But the other one, of course, was the boot camp. I talked about this with you directly. Um, but, I, I, you know, I, I still think a lot about um, you're trying to figure out yourself about your friendship with um, the redneck guy. Um, what was his name Rick. again? Yeah, Rick. yeah. Rick. Rick. I don't know. I mean, when I, I was reading that, I was kind of like, I, I, I could really relate to that. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm the kind of person... As well, you know, yeah, I instinctively reach out to people who I feel like have a, a different experience to me. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of interesting to, you know, to get to know people like that. I don't know. It's kind of like if there's one thing about that chapter, I guess in the end, the end itself was kind of, you know, a twist in a different direction, where it left me with the impression, perhaps like midway through, you were talking about you were planning to go and meet his girlfriend and hang out with him outside of boot camp or something. And that kind of dissipated, well, particularly after the, the incident that came out. Well, what, what, did, you, did you ever stay in touch with Frick after that? No. No, no yeah. I didn't, I didn't stay in touch with anybody from the service after that. Yeah, no, fair <laughs> enough. Yeah, well, no, it's I never a, even, yeah. And that, that happens. I mean, that, that is life. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. I mean, but it's probably most, most, well. most of those cats, I mean, particularly Burns and Frick, they were regular army, so... No. I was a reservist, so after after boot camp, I went to you know you have to go to um, military school to learn a uh, learn a job. Mm. So I went from South Carolina to Georgia. And I was there for like I don't know 18 weeks or something, and and after that I came back home. While these guys they have to go do um, service overseas, usually Germany or yeah, uh, yeah Germany is a popular spot or someplace in in the, in the states. So they were. You know, it was no. It was very little opportunity for us to keep in touch anyway. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't because you know we had a falling out or anything. I, I think it was just uh, you mm. know we just went our separate ways. Yeah, yeah. As well as things, I mean, I, I can relate to that experience of not instinctively hanging out with the people who expect you to hang out with them, and kind of you know what I mean, kind of being mm-hmm. seen as a bit odd or whatever, like going hanging out with the other people or whatever, and, and, and I guess you can self, and what I liked about your chapter on that was your own kind of, the way it worked out, it's kind of a self-analysis, I mean, done through, you know, your your drill sergeant, but, you know, kind of coming back, kind of, because he was trying to figure it out too, and I guess you were as well, yeah. but, uh, I don't know, I mean, part of me in a way kind of wishes almost that you don't analyze it, <laughs> because I think those relationships, those, those kind of interactions are really important in life, you know, like that's kind of weird. But uh, I don't know, I kind of like that that chapter a lot. There are a lot of aspects of that chapter, like well, that's one aspect, and there are a lot of other ones on that chapter that kind of uh, stay, you know, stay with me. Mm, yeah. There's things I can relate to and things that just made me think about things. Well, that will be something we have in common, Hiko-san, because <laughs> it stays with me, too. <laughs> yeah. Thank God it stayed with me, you know what I mean? Hmm. Yeah. There's something to write about. Yeah. Oh, man. Any other questions? Comments? Requests? <laughs> I'm open. I'm thinking. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, there's, there's more to that chapter on the 5%. Um, I, I didn't actually get to the part why I dedicate that chapter to White Boy Chris. But, oh, that's, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that part of it was good as well. That whole thing about, you know, having uh, to keep up a certain appearance. You've all, you've all read the book, I think, so you, you already know. Huh? Come again? White Boy Chris. 
No, no, the whole thing about yeah. it, and it's related to the white five percent thing as well. This whole thing you have to keep up a certain appearance for your own physical kind of safety at right. the same time. Yeah, and how that kind of came into that huge came to a head with white boy Chris. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I love that story. I can kind of relate to that as well. Yeah, man. I think that's a lot of it too. I think that people a lot of times they are really just trying to keep up appearances and that 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 behavior mm. that keeping up appearances behavior is sometimes really offensive stuff. <laughs> <laughs> really questionable stuff, man. I see it a lot here. Mm. Uh I mean, I had a really bad day the other day. Just, I had some really hateful thoughts going through my mind. I just needed some love. I'd go come home and listen to the Beatles and Stevie Wonder. I felt bad. <laughs> so, that was recently here in Japan. Oh yeah, man. <laughs> I went to Evie's the other night, and I went to Dotoa's. I'm waiting for my friend John. And he yeah. had to work late, so I wound up having to sit in there an extra half an hour. And, uh, you know, the old empty seat again. So right. <clears throat> somebody comes, puts their stuff in the seat, and then another seat opens up. They grab their stuff, move to the other seat. And another person came to the seat, and another seat opened up, and they moved over. This happened six times in a half an hour. That's amazing. I was like, this has to be a fucking record. And yeah, by the time the fifth one happened, I was... I was ready to put my bag in the seat and tell them all the fuck off, huh? Yeah, that was just sorry, a day. Say? That was just a day or two ago. I think I saw you tweet something about that recently. Yeah, I did tweet about it. Yeah, it was really awful, man. I was like, Jesus. And I was such I was such a good mood too, man. I had just done an interview with Japan Times. It went really well. They interviewed me about the blog and about the book. They cool. put it in the paper. I was feeling all high and. I come to Dotos and you got to, I have to I see this unignorable shit happening beside me. But anyway, that's life in Japan. <clears throat> this is not a, not a question, but like when I first came to Japan, I got to see like like to see firsthand being I don't know there's not a word that I know, but to be discriminated <laughs> For not being Japanese, but reading your book, I'm like, holy shit, that's ten times, that's a hundred times worse. And I'm just, it's fucking weird. I wish I could do something about it. Um, what can yeah. I do about it? There's a good question for you. There's a good unanswerable question for you. What can we do about <laughs> it? Um, well, I look. There definitely needs to be some. Uh, first, the problem has to be acknowledged. I don't even think the problem is acknowledged. Right. You know? So I that's agree. the first step. You know, people have to realize that there's a problem, and there's just not there's not a consensus on that. You know, there's there's a lot of people who are like, oh, it's your imagination. You're too sensitive. Blah 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 blah. So I'm like, okay. So it makes it really. You know, when when you have to fight against people who, <laughs> I don't know, people who experience it mildly and can't imagine it, and can't imagine the experience being intensified, trying to explain to them that it's it, it's uh, it's pretty intense here. It 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 really takes a lot out of me, man. And I blogged about it for three years, and you know, <sighs> I, I I'm almost feeling. Like I mean, you can see I haven't been blogging much lately because I, I don't know I'm losing it. So you're right. That's an unanswerable question. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I look at people like Debbie though, and, and you know, he's his activism has it's it's uh it's 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 not received well. You know, yeah, he, he's a lot of people hate him. He's made a lot of enemies because you know he maybe character wise, or personality wise, he's uh he's not the most savory guy, <laughs> but what he's trying to do, I really admire, man. I really do, man. And I wish that he, he could get more support, but it is, you know, he's the wrong messenger with the right message, I guess. Do you have a link to him? I don't know who you just said. Debbie.org. Debbie <laughs> Debbie 
Maybe I don't understand what you're saying. No, I don't know that. Oh, yeah. People yeah. Evil sin discrimination okay. case. Okay. Thank you. I mean, but, you know, I mean, he, he has some, I don't know. Anyway, no, I, I, uh, we, we, your book did it, did a favor for me. I mean, I guess you could only ever talk about what you know, your own, by your own experience. And and the biggest thing that you're up against is that people like me give an easier time than you. I mean, I, 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 it's probably hard for a lot of us to get beyond our own perception into the perception of another person and the experience of another person. That's what I appreciate again from your book and your blog. Right. And I, 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 I think I did appreciate this before that, but certainly it gave me a, an enhanced appreciation that, yeah, you know, different people here. Well, no, I knew this firsthand, not, not knowing any black people, but knowing other Asian people here, for example. Uh, I know that in New Zealand I took the same subjects and we took Japanese and we all got the same scores. We all came to Japan and my friends are working in kitchens and I'm working in a suit. <laughs> um, Literally, you know, like right. people. So I, I knew in the case of other Asians, for example, that you know, I, I knew that I, I received strange, favorable treatment, and, and this is what gives me, you know, as we as we've discussed before as well, a, a short temper with uh, oversensitive white people, as I perceive them, right. and I've been guilty of probably <laughs> saying too much to Debido. Uh, but I, I, you saw, I, 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 I was willing to try to have, a, have an intelligent discussion with him. Um, but he's been in too many fights on the net. I think that's it. He's been, he's had too many trolls. So he's right. kind of he doesn't, and he doesn't have to engage someone like me. But uh, <laughs> you know, he's 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 he's, he's got his followers. And, and yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, well, one, I respect that he's done a lot of very good things. In fact, I, I had a great get together the other night. I, I, I know a guy who's like um, used to have to his commute was in the middle of the night on a bicycle down Yaskunidori and like he has to go past five or six korban at three o'clock in the morning on a bicycle. Guy and he had like was stopped at the same korbans four times on his route every day on consecutive days by the same guys. <laughs> and wow. uh, it was the the Debbie Dill sites guy dealing with the police in Japan was kind of uh, his, his saving grace and there were a lot of, there's a lot of pa passive aggressive advice on it but it's advice I've passed on to other people, I've used to cite, you know, to, to help out other people so I appreciate a lot of the good stuff that he does and, and even I, I, I mean I appreciate it as well but I, I don't want to get too deep into the microaggression thing, I, I, I totally am comfortable with it existing and, and with the fact that, you know, people like you experience it a lot more than for example that I do I, I, I have this, the grain of salt with, with David Orr. painting a situation like I use chopsticks well as it applies to someone like me and saying that that's, <laughs> I mean, uh, I have trouble with that situation, but I, I, I right. accept that, but I do accept <coughs> that it exists and I accept, uh, and I, I understand basically where the origins of it are from or whatever, but um, but yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, but this is, I think, the important thing, I guess, once a month, once a month, one, one, on the one hand, amongst foreigners is to understand that yeah, we all do experience Japan differently, and this is what you're up against. You're up against people like me who have only been here for six months and are having a great time and want to tell all the other foreigners to be quiet. <laughs> and there's a lot of people who feel you who do that. And, and, and the other thing, of course, is, yeah, is, is Japanese people, and being Japanese people. Uh, it is a mix amongst that. I mean, I know. A lot of I know Japanese people, for example, you know, actually proactively interested in black people, for example, you know, black culture, and you know, like kind of groupies of, you know, like I, I have friends like this, you know, girls who date black guys and you know are into the the fashion and the music and everything. So you have on that one side you have the kind of fans and you have the kind of neutral and then you have the kind of strange reactions like you like you get a lot. Right. But I, I guess it's hard for the people to understand if they're not the perpetrators of the behavior to understand that other people, a lot of other people behave a different way that they're not aware of, you know what I mean? So right. all that you can really do is give them the experience and the awareness of it, which your book contributes to. But I guess it needs more voices. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Definitely needs more voices. I'm like, um, there was a, 
a woman who, I mean, she's recently left Japan. I don't know if you know her, but her mm-hmm. her her tag name is uh, Orchid, Orchid sixty four. I don't know. Uh, sure. Yeah, she's just totally awesome, man. Totally, totally awesome. But um, yeah, some of the things she says just spot on, and. I don't know. It's 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 words like her, like words like hers that really encourage me, man. That really keep me going when I really feel like uh, <laughs> I just want to turn my back on 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 this place. I really do. I really do sometimes, but I I, I would hate to do that because I feel like I feel like uh, a loser. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I. I Surrendered to racism, mm. you know, and I and I didn't come from that credo. You know what I mean? Mm. Right. And I came from the credo that produced Obama. <laughs> mm. so, you know, um, Matthew, r- r- rhyming Gushin? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he well, I think after I did my review, I, I had a lot of people like send me messages about my review and stuff. And Matthew was, uh, he was really. Well, besides uh, besides from already loving you and already loving the book. He was like really loving <laughs> that that people like me were backing him. And he, he, mm-hmm. he sent me a couple of really nice messages as well. But he was re- he was really excited as well that the message that uh, that that your message was getting out that way. Yeah. Uh, and and he's a guy as well. I mean, I've I've had a couple of conversations. I met him a couple of times. I mean, I love what he does. But uh, I've never like. It's funny for me. He doesn't dwell on the kind of stuff, and he doesn't talk a lot about the kind of stuff that you talk about. But it was clear from the messages I got after your book came out that, oh yeah, yeah, that 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 totally, you know, like he he was. I guess he's kind of happy that you were saying the message for him. <laughs> um, but I, I there's heard, a lot. There's a lot of that here, yeah. and I don't know why. I really, I people really can't figure out why. People don't want to put themselves out there and be seen as the person who's saying it. I guess I, I don't know why. I, I know mean, why, because it's scary, because this culture frowns upon it. Not just this culture, which culture you mean? Like, to, to, to say, if in Japanese culture, to do anything that's not along the lines of what people think people are supposed to do, it's frowned upon. you got to do what you're supposed to do in Japan, because that's Japan, right? Well, negativity is frowned upon, definitely. If, you, if you're seen as a complainer, there is a yeah. there is a strong resistance against that. That's an example, right? The the key um, like we are a peaceful country kind of thing. There's no gays in Japan, kind of thing. I mean, it's it's ridiculous, but that's the belief, and so people don't want to go against that because they're gonna lose all their friends, kind of deal. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I I feel you because you know I've lost friends over this. I'm listening to you. I'm like I'm that guy. I'm the one who's telling them, what? Are you kidding? <laughs> There's gays everywhere around here. I'm thinking half the guys I see are gay. They don't know. I, it. Yeah, it's I know. Hiding it or in exactly. the closet. And and that's how I talk to my Japanese friends. And I don't. I, I lost. I lost a few, but some of them they really appreciate. You know that somebody is giving them a different perspective, man. You know, I don't know. I don't. Know. I, I, don't, I really don't think that that's what it's about. I think it's about what I said in the book, which is they're not worried about the Japanese. They're worried about the foreigners here. <laughs> the foreigners are the ones who are going to come at you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've never been worried about the Japanese. The Japanese are. They are. If, if you can present this uh, argument to them, even if it's Something that they they this is, this is um, something they've never really considered before. If you present it properly, you know, with you know clear evidence. I mean, they spend any time with me, they're going to see what I'm talking about anyway. And right. actually, they already they are aware of what's going on. They're not totally in the dark. They know what's going on here. They just never have to deal with it because they really have to interact with foreigners. But I'm talking about I have private students. We're sitting in a restaurant, and people who are moving away from us, you know. <laughs> what are they going to do? They're going to act like it's not happening. They can see it happening. So I don't know. I, I, I don't think that's it. I think it's definitely 
the they don't want to be on the the business end of the people like uh, the people who are very I don't know, I hate to use that word apologist and stuff like that but <laughs> the people who are um, Japan friendly <laughs> very Japan friendly to the point of ignoring the the the, the very serious issues here or or just or just Focusing on the high-level issues here, like uh, housing discrimination or job discrimination, which to me, I, I mean, I, I've really never experienced any discrimination here. You know, I've never been told like, well, one time I was told I can't come in this place, but there's, there's no, I haven't re experienced any of that Jim Crow type discrimination here. You know, the only thing that I've experienced is stuff on that could be classified as microaggressive or I don't even think of it as microaggressive, whatever that. I mean, I, when I wrote that book, I described the behavior I'm talking about. And this is before this microaggression came about, but I didn't have a terminology for it. I just described what it was, what I saw every day. Yeah, you know, and continue to see, you know. <laughs> and and I don't know. That's not being addressed at all. That's not being addressed at all, or is, or is being belittled. You know, you're taught, you're, you're, you're called the uh, oh, stop, stop whining about. It. So what? They didn't sit next to you. Big deal. I'm like, that's that's a, to me, that's a racist attitude. That they can accept that kind of behavior from one person when they wouldn't accept that shit back home. You know, if they were at the the, I, I don't. For example, back in New York, if ah, that's a good not point. New York, not, or maybe not New York, but back in their respective countries, you know, the kind of things that that would would definitely not be tolerated or tolerated here, you know, and why? What a Japanese uh, allowed to drive, allowed to park in the handicapped zone of human? <laughs> no, I don't <laughs> think so. I don't consider them handicaps. <laughs> I look at them as equals, and that's the problem. When you don't look at them as equals, then you can accept all types of foolishness. But if you look at them as equals, then it becomes intolerable. Mm. Or sh well, not easily toler tolerated. Put it that way. Obviously, it's, a to it's tolerable. I'm still here. <laughs> but not easily tolerated. Yeah, I talk about the, the, the foreign community here as well. I, I mean, this came out of really strongly after the quake, of course, and all the drama after that. But um, I, 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 I've done a bit of rationalizing of this and blogs and so on as well. But, you know, I, there's one thing about the, the foreign community in Tokyo. It's a lot of, it's a lot of kind of early to mid-20s, a lot of guys on their own here, you know, it's a real kind of testosterone charge, kind of wild west in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of guys for, you know, who, especially online and so on, who, you know, are looking for things to lash out at. I mean, they can be vicious. I mean, this whole, this whole thing about fly jeans, for example, being, you know, the, the, the fly jean concept does, didn't exist outside of the, the foreign community, you know, different, different clicks beating up on one another. But, um, it's that same kind of, it's very intense. Uh, to me, it just seems to be kind of testosterone driven. Um, of certain people. Testosterone kind of, driven, really? Yeah, I think it is. I think it was people who are spending too much time, you know. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, I mean, it's different. And then the time to the fly chain thing, what exactly is the issue? It's this idea that um, some, some people put around the idea that the people who were leaving Japan after the quake were. Um, being mocked by Japanese and being called fly jeans. Um, it's a fact. Uh, the, I think the, the, it was a pun on a gaijin blog. Some guy made up the, the, the idea that you know, the pun on, on gaijin is fly jeans. And a foreign media picked it up and spread it around. And of course, the people who left were hypersensitive about the idea that they're perceived as leaving and not trying to protect their families or whatever. Um, and the people who stayed were very very standoffish and I, I, I had friends even like I told my friends to like um, go easy on some of the people with families and so on who were getting their families out and even that they were saying you know you're just trying to you know you're just trying to say whatever's popular you're not you're not being honest or whatever I'm like 
no, I'm just trying not to be an asshole. But you know, people kind of take up these strong, tight positions without thinking too much about them, and they get super aggressive and defensive about them in, in, in different directions. And the whole thing, you know, the English teachers versus bankers, or the, you know, the Japanese speakers versus non-Japanese speakers, the apologists versus Japan critics, you know, the whole, all, all this kind of, it's all, it's all, almost always guys, it's almost always super aggressive, you know, it, it, it's unfortunately kind of a defining part, I think, of the, you know, the very small English-speaking Gaijin community here that we're like super mean to each other. <laughs> Really? Uh, that's, that's I missed that whole thing. Really? I missed that whole episode. No. I, 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 I remember you, you just a, a, a small me. part of it. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, well, I, 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 I've seen bits and pieces of it. I've, I've had it hit me, unfortunately. When I, I try to stay well away from it, but it hits me every now and then. It did in the last few months. But, um, wow. I think it's part of what's probably hard enough Debbie do as well. He, he's encountered a lot of that sort of thing. I think, you know, when you're used to boxing online so much, as I'm sure he is, you know, I'm sure that's part, partly what makes him so abrasive. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I'm trying. I don't want to become abrasive. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you're abrasive. I, 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 try, I try to be really tolerant. I mean, I wrote a post the other day because I was venting, I'm and sure. <laughs> I, I, I made no comments. I left the, I, I closed the comments. I didn't want to hear what anybody had to say. <laughs> I had to get it out of my system because that's how I was feeling, man. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's how I feel often, actually, but I never really write about it. I just say, just leave it alone because, actually, my, even I, even I don't like to be attacked by people saying, "Oh, you're just bitter. You're just." This. I'm like. Look What's wrong with bitter? God damn right I'm bitter. <laughs> you know? I'm bitter. I'm I got a right to be bitter. <laughs> you know, the treatment here is ridiculous sometimes. You know, I'm not consistently bitter, I just I have my moments. You know, and I got I, get out my cycle. I have heard and I believe this that if I can see a fault in somebody very clearly, that means that I have re I have the same fault, but I just won't recognize it in myself. So if they're saying, "Oh, you're just bitter," I believe that's because they're bitter, and maybe like stuffing it inside themselves. And look how smiley a person I am. I'm not bitter, but really they are. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of it. I mean, you know, I yeah. think there's a, there's a lot of stress venting online in different ways. Right. Amongst us. And it can be really nasty the way that some people express it. I think that's absolutely right, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely that is stress. Uh, but anyway, I want to thank you guys for coming out. I'm going to close this down now. Cool. It's been about two hours, but uh, thank you guys for hanging out. It was a Loco. pleasure talking to you. Yeah. And uh, thanks for the ongoing support, and, you know, you can tweet about this. I'm going to leave it up on YouTube, so you can put up links to it if you like. Okay. And uh, thanks again. Have a good night. Enjoy your day off tomorrow. I think all of you, all of you in Japan, so you're off tomorrow, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I love, I've lived here 14 years, I still can't remember the public holidays, so it's like every holiday is like a special <laughs> bonus. It's great. Woohoo, holiday! I found out about it on Friday. We had Monday off. I found out on Thursday, yeah, same thing. I'm like, oh, really? Really? What? <laughs> yes! Hooray! Yeah. Anyway, enjoy your days off, yeah. and uh, we'll do this again sometime. All right. Okay. Thanks, Loco. Right, have, have a good, good night, night, everybody. Thanks again. All right. Thanks for Please. having us. Pleasure to finally meet you. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. Good night. Good night.